Okay, and uh, I, I, uh, we're faced with this. This is a threat to the Western way of life, to civilization as we know it, fatherlessness. It's much bigger, it's been under the radar. You've heard the statistics today. I want to concentrate on what is the solution. As we know, a secular society will find a solution and a way to get rid of the unwanted dead weight in their culture. Hitler had a solution, Margaret Sanger had a solution, and uh, Paul Pott had a solution. A lot of people have a solution. I was on the plane this morning with Nathan Tabor, and a school teacher of 30 years said, hey, I heard you talking. I have a solution. Uh, but you don't want to hear it. I said, what is it? She said, sterilization. Um, Sterilize the kids that are undesirable. That's the only way. And I said, wait a minute. You know, I kind of recommend sterilization for this guy, according to Nathan, but I don't feel like I'm ready for it myself. But anyway, sterilization, that's the secular world and abortion. Get rid of the dead weight. And believe me, as we become more secular, and this becomes more expensive, they will find a way to get rid of these people. But for people who are God-fearing and who are faith-based and believe that man indeed and every child is created in the image of God, and endowed with certain potential for God's glory, and life is sacred, we look at it a different way. So I'm going to show you a video right now that presents another way to deal with this fatherless problem, and maybe the only way I know that we can do it. An elephant uh, is capable of killing a runner. Why would they do it? Well, like juvenile delinquents from urban jungles, they'd grown up without role models. What's different is they don't have a father. Everyone needs a dad. <laughs> I think everyone needs a role model. And the, these elephants that left the herd had no role model and uh, no idea of how to, what appropriate elephant behavior was. Thrown together without any adults to calm them down or teach them how to behave. That's when the killings at Peelensburg Park began, and he was the gang leader. Here he is sparring with one of his pals. But the attacks became more violent. At one point, Mafuda spent seven hours stubbornly going after a group of rhinos. The rangers were baffled by the behavior of these young male elephants. It was strange. It was unprecedented. But then a pattern began to emerge, and the reason behind the delinquency became clear. And the solution turned out to be the biggest Big Brother program in the world. The Rangers went looking for big daddies, role models. They fired tranquilizer darts into older males, packed them up, and hauled them away to the Peelensburg Park. It was like teenagers running on the loose. That's right. That's and all of a sudden, Dad comes home. Suddenly, he's there, and Dad is very obvious to them. And in Dad's presence, we, we predicted they wouldn't try and assert themselves. Now, was it, was it just Dad's size, or did Dad's behavior influence them? Dad's behind as well. The Pillsburg juveniles seem to be reading the message loud and clear. Since the big bulls arrived, not one rhino has been killed. Okay, that makes a big point. Role models, mentors. I was at a recent uh, workshop, I think Phyllis actually led that, and uh, I asked a question of a social scientist, how do you stop 13, 14, and even 12-year-old girls from getting pregnant? And uh, he said, well, tell them they'll be poor the rest of their life if they do that, and a lot of other bad things will happen. And I thought to myself, tell them, tell them, Give me a break. What they need is someone to come beside them and walk them through this difficult part of their life. This is what we need, and we've started an organization called the Christian Association of Youth Mentoring. We, have a, we work with churches and other faith-based organizations, and we have about five to 6,000 kids being formally mentored right now and it's spreading, the churches are starting to get involved as never before as part of their ministry. 
Jesus said, or James said, visit the widows and uh, the orphans, okay? But in the Old Testament, God said he'd be a father to the fatherless. We have an obligation. If we believe life is sacred, then we want to know that we have an obligation to make sure these people live out their potential and they will not do it without our help as mentors. This is a, a development in North Carolina that we have adopted, uh, the U Canaan Society, I belong to that with Ted. We've adopted this, we're trying to do some free market stuff there, help people get into their little businesses and so on. And we have a kids Bible club every Saturday morning. <clears throat> And also, we are mentoring kids. The next slide I want to show you is some kids I took to Wake Forest when they beat, uh, who was it, Miami the other Saturday. Okay, Wake Forest, these kids went to the Coliseum, they ran over, all over, and uh, they just really had a great time. Well, each of those guys is an individual with individual talents and individual goals. The biggest education I've gotten about fatherlessness is to talk with mothers who have children. If you go to a housing project or anywhere in your church and you see a mother who has no husband who's trying to raise her kids, talk with her. What are your goals for your kids? How did you get in this situation? They didn't ask for it. Circumstances happen. When they were 13 and their mother got pregnant at 13 and they were born and they got the pattern in their family already, how do you break that cycle? They didn't ask for that. This is what they were taught. This is what they, their role model said. And the next one you'll see, these are individuals. This is a kid that I'm mentoring myself. He, wants, he has NFL in his mind. I'm not sure he'll ever make it, but you know what, that dream? Athletics is about the biggest dream some of these kids have. And without that, they really wander away. So anyway, uh, you, mentoring, spend a couple hours a week with a kid doing whatever you do normally. Just take a kid with you. Christian Association of Youth Mentoring, I've got it right here. There are 350, 340,000 churches in the United States. Uh, there are 145 million church members. There are 20 million kids right now looking for a mentor. Excuse me if I get excited and loud about this. and I don't want me to be harsh because this is a wonderful opportunity for the church, for faith-based people. We need to, and there are only 800,000 kids now, including Big Brother and the other organizations, being formally mentored after out of 20 million who need mentoring right now. So listen, get this brochure. If you have any interest, let us know. Your church, your organization. This is Chris. Show me the other. Show me the other. This is a little girl who's 13. She's bright. She makes all ages. She asked me personally, would you find me a mentor? Mr. Steele, would you find me a mentor? This was about four weeks ago, and I promised her I would. I have not found her a mentor. If I don't find her a mentor, or someone doesn't, she will never realize her goals, which is to be a school teacher, an educator. She has no daddy, no man in the house. This is a sad story, but it's a wonderful opportunity for Laura. And the next slide is the organization we have, Christian Association of Youth Mentoring, CAYM.org. This is the solution and the only one I know that really works. Faith-based mentoring for these kids and we all need to get involved with it. Thanks. Um, thank you and uh, please give a, another warm round of applause for our panelists. about uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers. Um, please, uh, come to the one or two microphones if you have a question. Try to keep it pithy and more of a question and statement. Thank you. My name is Gene Wisdom from Nashville, Tennessee. I'd like to kind of approach this from a different perspective, uh, which is George Gilbert's Men and Marriage, the issue of, of marriageless men and what impact that has on men and then ultimately society and families. What is your question? The issue of, of marriageless men, what men lose, what society loses by, okay. by men not marrying. Okay, you know, I think that uh, uh, the family we, we know we have so, uh, some data on the impact of marriage on men, uh, which is that, that men do um, 
uh, do better once they get married. You know, in, in other words, that's been studied quite a bit. It's not simply that the best men get married and the losers don't get married. There is something, although there's something to that. Um, but but it, but uh, it, even taking account of that, it's also the case that marriage helps men to mature. Uh, it helps them become better workers. They're more focused on their jobs, and uh, and they're just generally, you know, more focused in a positive direction. Um, but marriage is also helpful to women. Also, I, uh, the one thing, the only thing I resist about George Gilbert, because I think his stuff is brilliant, uh, I don't like the usage uh, of that that marriage civilizes men, because it makes it makes it sound like there's something uniquely defective about them, and and I and I resist. That a marriage is good for men, and it's also the gender complementarity uh, that comes about through marriage uh, benefit takes the rough edges off of both genders and, uh, and and helps both of them to to develop their potential. I disagree. Uh, men need civilizing. <laughs> uh, men, men who get married live nine years longer than women uh, than men who don't. Uh, women who uh, women live three years longer if they get married. Um, and I, I, I do, I appreciate your being sensitive to us not being civilized. But uh, what made the Wild West the Wild West? There were no women. <laughs> uh, you get large numbers of men and comparatively few women, and you get a pretty violent place. Yeah. And, and, and let me give you one example, just one, one example. If your car breaks down at 3 in the morning in a, on a desolate road, and a car stops behind you, if a 30-year-old man gets out of that car, you have one reaction. A 30-year-old man gets out of that car holding a two-year-old boy, you have a totally different reaction. And it's a reaction based on reality. You know, um, we have another uh, honored guest that I didn't even see until he came up to the mic, uh, Jim Martin of the 60 Plus Association. Thank you for coming, Jim, founder of the 60 Plus Association. Thank you for coming to in just a second. I want to introduce you, but Phyllis Schlafly was, was oh, first up in the back line. She'll be, you'll be right after her. Well, this is a comment for everybody on the panel. I know we always have a lot of young libertarians who come to CPAC, and uh, a lot of the libertarian policy is to get government out of marriage. I would like you to reflect on the hypocrisy of that view, because you're not getting government out of divorce. And once the marriage breaks up, the government is in you with a terror. The government decides how every dollar you have is spent, how, how many hours and when you can see your own kids, where you live, whether you can go into your own house. The government is in total control of your life. So if you believe in getting the government out of the way, uh, let's get it out of divorce. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Phil has said it all, but let me just make a statement for the panel. Yes, I run a seniors group. My spokesman is a guy that you probably heard of, Pat Boone. And Pat Boone lives out. He's a committed Christian conservative who lives in Hollywood. You mentioned that earlier, Niger, Hollywood. He calls it La La Land. <laughs> and speaking of the March on Washington, Dr. Land, I was a young reporter back in those days. And I gotta tell you, after that, covering that march and a year or two later, when a Democratic president, Lyndon Johnson, said we're going to pass the Civil Rights Bill, it took a senator from Illinois, a Republican, Everett McKinley Dirksen, those Republicans to bring that vote around. I hate this race issue. Republican I am, racist I'm not. And for crying out loud, those Republicans delivered the vote. But nowadays, the press doesn't remember that. We need to remember that. It's just my comment. And, and sir, by the way, I, I want to add that uh, in 1952, 90 days into President Eisenhower's presidency, he desegregated Washington, D.C. and the federal government. Follow year I joined the Marine Board, I was one of the races. I was in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I, I had two questions. Uh, I think you guys are right on that most of the problems stem from cultural, from the culture, and from a, you know, lack of a, a secularization of the, of the culture and, and whatnot. But I think there's also economic issues at play. And so I'm, I've got two questions. The first thing, Dr. Morris made a comment about how, uh, about how feminism makes women view men as kind of bubbling idiots and not uh, prospective marriage candidates. And so. I'm, 
I, I'm wondering how much of that is a perception from feminism and how much of it is they actually are calling idiots who can't move up in the labor in the labor market and, and elevate themselves. And then my second question is, how much do you think uh, like an expanded child tax credit would help um, would help ease the stress on the American family going forward? I can hear you. I would. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure there's some people and I've read about them who rip off the government and charities, and they have children and they without a lot, and the government motivates that to a certain extent. I have never talked to a brother who has children who doesn't want to get off of welfare and want to finish an education. One lady with 11 children wants to get a GED and become a physical therapist. I've never talked with a brother, and I've talked to a lot of them. He said, I, I'm happy where I am. It's their caught in a vice. And we need welfare reform, but if you cut off the food stamps and you cut off the uh, the, the rent subsidy, what are they going to do? No job. Bad health sometimes. So, yeah, it's difficult, but they want to escape, and that's in our favor if we can just find a way to help them escape. Joining us as well is, uh, and I, I don't know if you have a panel coming up, uh, Ken, but I want to introduce you and, and invite you to stay for his panel as well. But uh, Ken Blackwell, the former mayor of Cincinnati, candidate for. Uh, Oh, sorry, Dr. Morris, please. Yes, a, a couple of things. You've asked a very big question. Where did, the, where did that person go? There, there you are. Okay, on the, on the child tax credits, uh, I think there are any number of ways that the tax code could be tweaked in a pro-family member uh, manner, but, uh, and, and we should be talking about doing those things. But I would just point out that in other countries that have done that, they have not had much of an uptick in fertility overall. So that suggests that what's driving fertility isn't simply economics, although economics matters, but there's a large cultural component. And uh, a p big piece of that cultural component uh, is, I hate to use the S word here, but if we're going to talk about marriage and we're going to talk about out of wedlock childbearing, we need to use the S word, which is sex. Because where I come from, <coughs> sex makes babies. Even in California, sex does make babies, you know. And so, so we, we have to, we, it, the idea that we can solve the marriage problem without addressing the underlying sexual culture, I think is not very realistic. At some point, we've got to take that bull by the horns and say that there's something, uh, that this is the, the, the wrong turn that we were talking about, the experiment that we're talking about, is the idea that, uh, that sexual activity and childbearing can, can be legitimately separated from, uh, from marriage, that that cultural meme is something that is really new in, 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 in human history um, and, and has been destructive all up and down the social ladder. But just put one last thought in your mind about this. I, I posed this question to a group of African American pastors about a week ago, and I just said, you know, look, what, what if uh, you, had, you could have had the civil rights revolution without having the sexual revolution at the same time? Where would the African American community be today? And they're all, you know, nodding their heads like, yeah, that that was that was a really destructive wrong turn uh, for their community. Well, just to reemphasize, as I said, this is my opening opening remarks. In the height of the civil rights movement, illegitimacy in the black community was under 25 percent. Now it's above 85 percent. So I kind of like the truth is in the pudding. Um, let me, I'm going to take a moderator's privilege and ask a question myself. We have a few. We have about 10 minutes, so you'll have time to answer all your ask all your questions. But I was wondering if anybody on the panel would want to address the negative birth rate that exists in the West in the West in general, sure. in Europe, in Japan, and the fact that we do not have a negative birth rate. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I think uh, the the biggest Achilles heel of moral relativism is that everywhere it has gone, it produces catastrophically low birth rates, below replacement birth rates. Um, the West is depopulating. Japan leads the way because in 1945, Japan didn't have a baby boom. It legalized abortion. And last year, Japan sold more adult diapers than they did baby diapers. Uh, if that's not a sign of rest in peace on the civilization, I don't know what is. But the birth rate among non-Muslim Russians is 0.1%. 
0.85. The replacement rate for a society is 2.1 per, per mother, per woman. In the United States, it's about 1.8. We would be depopulated if it weren't for immigration. Um, the world is depopulated. Mexico's birth rate has dropped through the floor, and uh, we're going to be paying Mexicans to come to America in 20 years to work instead of trying to keep them out. And in, I even this is a worldwide phenomenon, even in Muslim countries. In Iran, the birth rate has dropped in half in the last 20 years. And in America, the birth rate has dropped exactly half from what it was at the height of the baby boom in the 1960s. And what happens when moral relativism comes in is that human life is devalued Human beings are looked upon as a liability rather than a resource. And you have plummeting population. We are in the midst of a worldwide baby bust. And it's going to have catastrophic consequences because, for instance, in America and in Western Europe, the social welfare system is based upon the assumption of an ever-expanding pyramid. What we've done through aborting 55 million babies and through almost universal oral contraception is we have inverted the pyramid. We've got this huge 78 million baby boomers with not enough millennials and baby busters to support them. And we're going to be rationing, we're already rationing health care, and we're going to be doing more of it in the future uh, as the birth rate uh, slows. And um, abortion is a genocidal race in the black community. Uh, last year there were twice as many black babies aborted as were born in New York City. Uh, Richard, I was, don't you think I read at least one sociologist that secularization of a society leads to low birth rate because God told man to replenish the earth in the Old Testament, the very beginning. And if you don't, they, they, kids are a pain in the neck for many people. Okay? They're a blessing, and God told us to do it. But many people say, hey, I don't want to lose my vacation. I don't want to go through this pain. I don't want any kids. But we have a mandate from God, and I think that's an important part of that. And, and, and as my East Texas grandmother used to say, she had to talk with each of her grandchildren. I understand from some of my cousins it's a little different for the granddaughters than it was for the grandson. But the talk was there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. And as long as you can get the milk for free, nobody buys the cow. <laughs> well, I have a little pithy saying of my own, even though I'm not a grandmother and I'm not from East Texas. Um, uh, but I, I would concur with what has been said, but put it a little bit different way. I think one of the things that's happened to our birth rate is that people are calculating whether it's worth it to have a child or not. And the minute you start the calculations, you're sunk because you will always come to the conclusion that it's not worth it. Right? I mean, it, 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 there, there's no, it's the utilitarian calculus let's control everything kind of mindset that has followed modernity and that has followed secularism. So my, I have a very simple solution to all the young people, um, which is the solution to birth, the falling birth rate is simple. Stop calculating and let her rip. Trust, trust, well, no, we, can, we can say that, but when you look at unemployment rates, especially in the black community, in Chicago we have 50% black males, are uh, 50 percent unemployed in Chicago, uh, and, and, and at the same time, we're called a sanctuary city, and they're bringing Hispanics in by the bus Um Babies cost money, and the latest stats I looked at, it was over three hundred thousand dollars to raise a child. My daughter happened to have gone to private school from K through 12 preschool, and she's at the University of uh, what is it, uh, New York University, that liberal bastard, but. Uh, the bottom line is babies cost money today. So it's not like before, it's not like the 60s, you know, the 70s, babies cost a lot of money. And there are very few jobs. The people are being, are, we're being replaced in the workforce as a member. So one of the, one of the things I want to talk about, Matt, just real quickly, is you know, one of the things that I want to put on the table is that because I see too many Americans being denied taxpayer funded jobs because they're not bilingual. That is a real issue in Illinois and in Chicago. 
So you guys will probably be hearing about this pretty soon. Thank you. Yes? Um, I want to thank you for this fantastic panel. And um, a couple of questions. Uh, oh, first, it's got to come from, sorry, it's got to be one. One question having to do with you, Mr. Ennis, your, yes. your, um, your important point about uh, penetrating the culture, yes. the pop culture in Hollywood. Um, and uh, I was wondering the extent to which you think um, there already have been produced, I can't think of it, or will be produced, really compelling movies that look through the eyes of the child uh, at the tragedy of fatherlessness. Mm -hmm. You know, compelling movies with compelling screenplays that have universal resonance that, you know, and superb actors. So that's something that, you know, would make a huge difference, I think, if people could see these things through the child's eyes. I, I think it's an excellent point. There's a movie that has some deep flaws in it, but one of the good things it has about it is it did tell talk the story about uh, fatherlessness and the impact that it has on the black community. It was called Boys in the Hood. Again, mm -hmm. not, a, not a perfect movie, but it has mm -hmm. some strong values uh, in it. Unfortunately, we have, I can't believe we've wrapped, come out, finished our time here. I'm going to ask that the two folk who have questions ask your question, and then you ask your question, and then we'll let the panelists try to get both out of the park before we shut down. And could people bring their cards if they want to be entered in the, just bring them and set them up here and then I'll... I'll and of course the panelists will be here after we wrap up so you can ask them some one-on-one -on -one questions later. Please ask your question and then the last gentleman ask your question, please. My question is for you, Mr. Butler, specifically. When you uh, gave your speech, you started, well, you talked about Michael Jordan um, conceiving a child with a woman. And you said that she chose to do that because he um, was wealthy, a millionaire. But uh, my point, you know, Dr. Morris has talked about how um, God created this family unit. And I believe, and do you disagree with me, that the men have a responsibility in this situation. You have talked about how um, these teenagers don't have a role model. These girls don't have a role model. They're getting pregnant. They don't have anybody to tell them a role model. And I understand that women bear the responsibility for bearing and raising the children. I have four of my own. I understand that. But um, my point is, the men are responsible. God gave them a position as head of the household, and they have a responsibility to behave in certain ways with women. Do they not? Fair enough. I'm going to let them answer that very important question, but I want to hear the last one. Uh, I've been to CPAC conferences before. I'm the executive secretary of Bosworth, Virginia. I've been involved in this in 18 years. I work in Washington, D.C. I work with a lot of black males who are in this position. And uh, so far, I have heard no solutions from the panel. I think that CPAC has done this for the first time. The one solution, mentoring, will actually make the problem worse. The simple solution is, I want to know if you think this is a simple solution. When we talk about fatherlessness, we talk as if the father died, he's not around. But I know in the black community, almost every child knows who her father is, and every father knows who her child is. It's not like he disappeared. It's the same thing in the white community. They all know who the father is in most cases. These don't disappear. Mentoring is not a solution. We always, all the churches, everyone does mentoring. It just helps promote fatherlessness because it ejects the father. The problem of fatherlessness and the reason the father's not there is because the father's been ejected from the family. When the mother has an 80% chance of winning the lottery, and I'm not talking about Virginia, but I think it's true in most countries, and she gets unaccounted child support to spend any way she wants, she does what many black men tell me. They don't want to give her child support because you may spend it on a boyfriend. That's the problem. The problem is our judicial system, how it works. The problem is no-fault divorce. The solution is we give, we deal with the custody issue and no-fault divorce, and marriage becomes meaningful. Right now, marriage contract is meaningless. It has nothing to do with anything. It's worse than any contract you have with a carpenter come to your house. Therefore, it's nothing. If we make the marriage contract meaningful, then marriage will become more important. And men then will see a need to be fathers. Right now, they see no need to be a father if they're going to be ejected from the family. So my question is, give me a solution, not mentoring. Uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me comment on this. I've been at this about 23 years. And um, the cycle has to be broken. A family 
cycle has to be broken. Yeah, there are some people that said, if I get pregnant, I'm going to get money, get pregnant again, get more money, and then I'll live off of that and I won't have to work. There are some people I haven't met yet. If you're 13 years old,